Good morning and welcome everyone. Thank you all for being here. It's a true honor to be here on Algonquin territory with so many veterans, Canadian Armed Force me members who have all served this country with dignity and honor. It's a pleasure to be back here with this dedicated group who selflessly give their time and efforts to support veterans and their families. Since we last met, a lot has gone on here at the department across Canada that will have an impact on veterans. I have gone from coast to coast to coast to engage with local veterans as we finalize the reopening of the Veterans Services offices and hosted a series of roundtable discussions. I met and spoke with a wide range of veterans and heard a variety of perspectives and stories. I also had the honor of presenting Minister of Veterans Affairs Accommodation Awards across Canada, from St. John's, Newfoundland to Vancouver, BC, and everywhere in between, to people who have demonstrated their dedication and commitment to veterans. These ceremonies and the people they recognize are truly inspiring. Their personal commitment to care, compassion, and respect is obvious. These three words are at the core of what we do and should always strive to do at Veterans Affairs. Together we will continue our work to ensure that all of Canada's veterans, Canadian Armed Force members, RCMP personnel and their families receive the best possible service in their own communities. Many of you are aware of the changes to the ELB program and see some of the problems that we have. Even with adding billions of dollars to the program to put more money into the pockets of veterans, outdated legislation, gaps in the funding model, and policy conflicts keep creating barriers to prevent some of that money from getting where it needs to go. Thousands have benefited but we have to ensure that every effort is made to help those who have fallen between the cracks. Created by a patchwork of programs, we need to change the current system to create an easy to access, simple to navigate, veteran-centric process. I admit, we are not where we need to be. We need to do something transformative to do more than just slap on another piece of policy tape each time the system springs a leak. As you know, the Prime Minister gave me an aggressive mandate with the bottom line of doing more for Canada's veterans, to strengthen services, to ensure financial security and independence, to increase education and employment opportunities, and to better support mental and physical well-being. Canadians and many of you made it clear they were unhappy with the state of services for veterans. We needed to make a change and I enlisted your help, your advice to do just that. We need your help to find the best way to balance good public policy with fiscal reality, to move toward on the four general pillars of the mandate. My mandate letter outlined the broad steps I need to take to remake this system, and my consultations with you here and across Canada is providing me with the specific details about what should be done. Well, we, we have a daunting task ahead of us, and I say us because we're all in this together. Our success depends on us working to find solutions that can be implemented in the years to come. We've been working together for 10 months now, and it's a good time to take a step back and to look at the progress we've made and focus on what's ahead. As we discussed at the May Summit, Budget 2016 was a defining moment for the department as we delivered on many of the mandate letter items. We restated the Government of Canada's commitment 
to the well-being of veterans and their families. And we invested $5.6 billion in additional financial benefits. This re represented a large portion of government spending in the last budget. Some would say that we haven't made any progress. I believe that is unfair. In fact, I would say it is untrue. I would like everyone in this room to recognize the steps we've taken, and despite the work and effort we have made, I recognize we have lots of work ahead. Our Prime Minister committed to being open and transparent when he took office and is a firm believer in consulting Canadians, as am I. This is why I created the online Have Your Say, Say tool to get direct feedback from veterans and Canadians. This is why we facilitated 30 roundtables across the country this summer to discuss priority issues facing veterans. This is why you are here for this summit, the third you have been to since our government took office a year ago. And why earlier this year, we created the six advisory groups. I am eager to hear from each of you report on the progress to date. This summit is your summit. You have shaped the agenda and determined the priorities for our discussions for these two days. Your advice and recommendations are the foundation of our policy proposals and the work we have accomplished, the work we are going to do today, and the work we will need to undertake in the future as I move to fulfill my mandate commitments. I have a very clear objectives coming out of the summit. First, we will all have a common understanding of the challenges we face going forward and a shared knowledge of the reality we're operating in. On the bigger picture, if you will, the time it takes to implement new policy and the related fiscal demands that compel us to prioritize. Second, we will have heard and discussed the advisory group's identified reports and been able to look at which suggestions would make the biggest difference for our veterans and their families. Third, I will have your best advice and recommendations, which will help inform the government as we prepare Budget 2017. You may have heard reports of a backlog of benefit applications. Some of this room may have experienced delays firsthand. I would like to assure you that we are taking steps to address the situation by streamlining the process. As of today, I am happy to report that more than 250 new frontline and support employees have been hired, and that number will grow to 400 in total before we're done. These new staff, as well as others previously hired who are completing their training, have allowed the department to increase its processing rate by 27%. And our outreach work to the veterans community, as well as starting new benefit programs and services, has resulted in an increase of applications by 22%. We will make sure that the case managers serve an average of 25 veterans at any given time. When we took office, many case managers were carrying 40 to 50 cases each. This was completely unacceptable. Our expanded outreach in the North is also essential to ensure that Indigenous people who have served our nation with pride and distinction, as well as other residents of the North, can access the same level of service and benefits available to veterans in other parts of the country. We're also very excited by a new pilot project that just launched in a few cities across the country where veterans will be given one-on-one -on -one assistance with applying for benefits and services to ensure they are getting the most out of what the department has to offer. 
With the numbers and the priorities back in balance, we are better positioned to deliver on our mandate. But changes of this magnitude take time and require a holistic approach. We need to ensure we're putting the right policies in place in response to the identified need within the context of the mandate letter and based on informed discussions. I know some of you have questions on a few of the mandate items we're still working on, including a return to a pension style option in our financial benefits. We are committed to getting this done, but we're also committed to getting this done right. I know you want to, us to get it right too, and that takes time. And I'm looking forward to what the policy group has to say in this regard. A recent ombudsman report outlined some of the challenges. He applauded our increase to the disability award and recognized the positive aspects of the new veterans charter, but acknowledged that some veterans were not doing as well under the NBC, often from a fiscal perspective. I also note that our disability award and earning loss benefit increase was a recommendation from the Ombudsman that was widely supported by stakeholders. We accept these comments and critiques and will continue to do so as we move forward. In addition to your collective effort, I also will ask your patience. If you allow me to use another analogy, we are rebuilding the ship while we are sailing on it. We need to continue to providing resources to veterans while we review programs that we use to providing them. This means that there will be going to some squalls in the future, some that we can predict and some that we can't. This summit is going to be out hearing what the advisory groups have to say and what you have to say about those recommendations. Some of the things we're going to discuss today will perhaps see in budget 2017. Some of it may find itself in more fulsome performance in budgets after that. We're having a, sh we're having a short session later this morning on how new policy proposals and initiatives get from initial concept to actual implementation. It's not as easy as you might think, as myself and many of my cabinet colleagues found out last year when we were introduced to the budget process. We heard loud and clear at a previous summit that po the positive impact of new mental health clinic would make in the lives of our veterans and their families. In Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, and we delivered opening the doors in June. We asked the men and women of this country to do the heavy lifting for us on the front lines, and we will find a way to get them the treatments they need when they get back so they can live better and healthier lives. Which is why we continue our work to ensure a seamless transition and to redefine the forces continuum from soldier to civilian, which is more difficult for some than others. I'm working closely with Minister Sajan to ensure that transition is as smooth as possible. This work concludes creating a comprehensive veterans career transition and employment strategy. Last year, close to 10,000 Canadian Armed Force members, regular and reserve force, released from the military. Almost 20% of releasing members were medical releases. Our support to those medically released veterans is critical. We need to ensure they have access to the services they need where and when they need them. And with Mental Illness Awareness Week upon us, I can't help but emphasize this point. One of our government's priorities is to ensure greater access and opportunities with Canadians with disabilities, 
which includes mental health illnesses, which is why I was pleased to announce recently our department's commitment of $500,000 of in-kind support to the Mood Disorder Society of Canada's Transitions to Community program, designed to help reintegrate veterans into communities and the workforce. This is just one of the steps we're taking to ensure the best mental health services possible for our veterans and their families. This leads us to the ongoing discussion about marijuana for medical use. This is a sensitive issue and one for which there is no immediate answer. I said before I was shocked to learn that no policy was in place around this and I intend to change that. But there are many different views on this matter amongst those in this room as well as amongst the broader community. Officials in my staff have been meeting with medical professionals, area experts, and beneficiaries to inform an internal review. We all recognize this is an emerging field and a complex issue with many facets to consider. If you want to continue this conversation, please take advantage of this event to speak with my office during the next couple of days. Other progress I have already mentioned include the improvements to the Disability Award, the Earnings Loss Benefit, and the Permanent Impairment Allowance. Through these programs, financial benefits, we increase financial benefits by $5.6 billion, which helps ensure veterans and their families receive the, the support they need to rebuild their lives and join the middle class a crucial component of our mandate. Because we understand that without financial security, veterans cannot focus on their mental health and physical well-being. Without uh, facilitating career transition, veterans won't feel positive about their new normal. We know there is more work to be done. Receiving my mandate, from Prime Minister Trudeau less than a year ago on November 4th was an experience I will never forget. I am proud of the strides that we have made in delivering on the government's agenda and remained, remain committed to implementing all 15 items on that mandate letter. There does need to be some understanding Rome was not built in a day. Some items in my mandate letter will take more time than others. And we want to continue moving in the right direction. And we need to hear from you what works, what doesn't, and what we can do better. As I said almost a year ago, we all have the same objective, to help veterans and their families across Canada live better and healthier lives. I believe this as much today as I did then, and I remain committed to finding solutions to ensure that every individual who Veterans Affairs Canada serves is provided with the care, compassion, and respect they so rightfully deserve. I would like to kick off this summit with a simple message, one of partnership. If we want all veterans to enjoy the highest quality of living possible, if we want to encourage remembrance in future generations, if we want all Canadians to know we exist to repay our nation's debt of gratitude toward all veterans, then we must work together. I won't pretend that there won't be disagreements, some public, some private, between some of you and our government about the timing and process as we move to accomplish these goals. But I always be ready to listen and ready to discuss. Let's not keep fighting old battles. Let's conquer new horizons. Thank you all for your pledge to help improve the lives of our veterans and for being here today. I appreciate your time, your advice, 
your service to our veterans, and to our country. Thank you so much. It's a great honor for me to be here on this journey we're on. Take care.